everybody here working on a project? I'm working like crazy. Daytime TV. <laughs> no, I'm Daytime. working like crazy. I, 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 uh, I work at home anyway, so sequestering doesn't mean anything to me. Right, same thing. Yeah. And, and uh, God, I've just been having, I don't know why, but lots of gigs coming in, plus also a lot of self-generated stuff, a lot more books. You mean you got wow. a lot of commercial work, Bill, or you got a lot of commissions, private commissions? Uh, people have been attempting to do private commissions with me, but I'm too busy doing the freelance stuff. Oh, aren't you lucky? That's fabulous. I, I do feel lucky. I don't know how long it's going to last. But That's fabulous. Well, it's yeah. always that way, whether it's a virus or not. Yeah. All right. Uh, welcome to the Masters of the Illustrated Film Poster Panel 2020. I want to start by thanking you all for tuning in today for the sequel to last year's epic panel and to my fellow artists. Thank you for making yourselves available for this special comic con <coughs> at home event. Welcome. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our panel, Steve Chorney. This is an alphabetical order. Steve Chorney. Hello. <laughs> James Goodridge. Hi. Greg Hildebrandt. Howdy. Rory Kurtz, Robert Rodriguez, oh. Akiko Sterenberger, Hello. William Stout, Hi guys. and Drew Struzan. Me. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm your host, Paul Shipper. And uh, I want to give big thanks to David Dirks from A Sea for Hollywood for helping us put this together and San Diego Comic Con for inviting us back again this year. So, um, what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about movie posters. We're talking about advertising and art and all the things that we all love. And I want to start by opening this first one up to the whole panel. And uh, as we know, during the mid-90s, advertising moved from illustration towards a digital and photographic approach. And recently, there has been a resurgence in the illustrative art again. Why do you think that illustration and entertainment advertising is back? <clears throat> Given the amount of content that there is being put out left and right, the amount that's actually using illustration is still remarkably small. You know? It's growing though. It's growing because, you know, because of streaming and, and there needing to be so many pieces of artwork per title, especially with Netflix, they're more open to different posters and, and trying to reach different audiences. That's and I, good to know. Yeah, and I think Mondo um, also helped kind of kick down the door with opening people up to collecting illustrated posters again. And so a, clients <laughs> getting into it, I think, uh, you know, eventually they've been wanting more of it. And there's also less money for photo shoots. So that's where an illustrator can come in and kind of fill in the blanks. <laughs> I'm noticing as well that many of the many of the young people that have grown up to become filmmakers uh, really look back with favor upon the illustrated poster. So that's also another feature, at least that I've experienced. Yeah, I think that, that won't bring back illustration. I mean, <laughs> you know, the, the, there's a couple, a couple stories I know about Drew, and uh, one one was the when he got commissioned to do the Hellboy poster by Guillermo del Toro and he was looking at it in rapturous awe and he said something to the effect of I can't wait to see this as the one sheet and according to my sources Drew walked over patted him on the shoulder and said oh Guillermo you're just about to find out how little power you actually have <laughs> there's lots of stories yeah there are <laughs> I have a friend who did a poster for his own film and he said the they said that no painting, no painting. We don't want a painting. Why? It makes the movie look old. But by the same token, that there's a degree to, to which I think that both are right. Because if you, rather like Steve's saying, none of the Deadpool illustrations would have come about were it not for Ryan Reynolds being absolutely hands-on and adamant about how he wanted those campaigns to look. You know, including the, the wide variety of advertising and the fact that he was absolutely single-minded and dogged in his, I want illustration. I want illustration here, here, and here. You know, so there's a degree to which 
there are people who, as Steve says, have, have grown up with that fondness and are able to use their, their force of will to change things. But then there's also the Tarantino thing, which is that, you know, finally, <laughs> thanks to Steve, he got his illustrated poster, you know, which is something that he's wanted for years. But one of the key things about a movie poster for me is that it's very much about um, storytelling in a single image. You know, I think the idea that like one image, you know, that's painted, you know, becomes the singular image for the movie that's used everywhere, you know, just, you know, they just don't do that much anymore. I mean, it's-, it's But that's the thing. It, the question is though, should they, or, or not even should they, wouldn't, it's not like it's beyond art to do that, to communicate with people and to touch people and particularly art which is produced not literally handmade as in necessarily pencil it can be digital but it still has the hand of the artist on there that connects with another human being you know i think the big problem is we went through a very conservative period where the people in charge of the studios knew nothing about art and so they knew that if they used a photograph of the movie star that was the movie star they didn't know enough to know that if Drew Struzan worked from that same photo, he could make that painting look more like the actor than the photograph. And that's something they never understood. Let's do one image that is absolutely stand out, that just sums up this movie, the promise of this movie, the spirit of this movie. Um, sometimes it's difficult to tell what the hell was the key art for that, you know, because it'll be such a, a, a series <clears throat> of images. And I think that's what, People like Akiko, if you like putting right these days, they are, you know, creating images that are, okay, well, that is the image for the last black man in San Francisco. That's it. It's got a concept. It's beautifully executed. It becomes that single image. You know? It can. It can. Yeah. yeah. It should. We all agree on that. Maybe because the film business is completely upside down right now, so they're desperate and and more likely to try something they haven't tried before. If I may speak to that for a moment, I've gotten more projects during this lockdown than I have before, simply because it's tough to get a photographic studio and it's, uh, its workings together under the lockdown. Again, bringing Akiko back into the conversation, she'll work digitally, she'll work with pencil and ink and watercolors, there's no medium she doesn't work in, as far as I know. Um, and it's the fact that an artist is working with Photoshop yeah. that makes the difference of Photoshop. It's not the program that's, that's an issue. She's able to do remarkable things with it. You know, so again, it's the mind that's creating it. It's the sensitivity of the person producing, never mind what the tool is that then makes the connection. It's what's going on in her head that makes the connection with the public. Well, that's correct. Of course it is. Yeah, that's so sweet. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was anti-digital computer for so long, too. I really held out as long as I could. Um, but then the deadlines just got crazier. And <laughs> certain genre of film, you know, my my um, more hand done stuff wasn't going to communicate what it needed to. So that's when I started dabbling with, with digital and different techniques. Yeah. But, but yeah, it's true. It's, it's whoever is using the medium. It's not the medium. You know? Of course. Of course. Yeah. Yes. The similar thing happened for me when I, cause I would, I learned the traditional way initially and I had a small portfolio in, in the early days of the internet and then penguin books saw what, my portfolio they stumbled on it somehow and they said um, we really like what you can do and we want to do these book covers um, but can you work digitally and I didn't at the time mm. and it was like I had to I, I had no work I just said yes I can work <laughs> <laughs> Paul's a liar <laughs> no I lied I did lie to get work so I went I just went out and got a copy of Coral Painter and a Wacom tablet I already had a computer for you know, as we, most of us had computers, one of those shiny iMacs. And then, uh, you know, just started learning and using the traditional style of underdrawing, which I'd learned from studying Drew's work, if I'm completely, I mean, Drew knows where I, I came from. It's from watch, watching Drew's 
looking at his work and studying it to 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 the ninth degree through a magnifying glass. So I worked on underdrawing and then um, airbrush, digital airbrush, and then digital pencil crane. I did the same technique in the digital realm, and they were happy. So I got work. So I just thought, well, I I still get to create something in an aesthetic that excites me. Um, I'll just do my best to get better at this and hopefully I can you know, break into something. And I still painted traditionally up to around 2012. And then uh, I haven't painted anything really until just before lockdown, I started doing another real painting for somebody they've asked me. So I'm, I'm getting there. Oh, and if you're yeah. familiar with Paul's work, it's beautiful. It's, a real, it's really very nice and a nice tribute to Drew's work. Well, thanks, Steve. Yeah. Well, I'm done working. I retired. So he, he handed the baton to you, Paul. <laughs> so, so Paul's, Paul's turn to run with it now. Yeah. I well, think we're all running with it in our own way. Things go in phases anyway, um, because after people had gotten so used to seeing illustrated movie posters, they got kind of tired of it and they started doing these real exciting uh, digital ones. But now we've seen them all the time. And so well, now it's going back um, because it's exciting. If you give people the same thing all the time, then it gets to be a bore. Except that's what they did when Photoshop came in. I can't tell you how many hundreds of posters I saw that were exactly the same. A guy yeah. spent half in light and half in dark. It's yeah. like, oh, God, it's so boring. <laughs> but Akiko, you've been an art director. So what can you say? Well, I mean, for every poster, there are thousands and thousands of posters being created alongside of it just from one agency. And most of these agencies are competing against other agencies. So these clients from just one agency is seeing in one round, maybe close to 60 different posters. Right. And they go through rounds and rounds and rounds. So, I mean, they're just seeing so much at once and the turnarounds for each poster are getting shorter and shorter. They just want to see versions of things. They sometimes go back to things that they said no to. Um, they, some posters might go through a few ho hoops, but then the marketing team or focus group may slam that again. So there's just so many different factors going on before one kind of gets dwindled down to the end. And there just isn't the time for them to focus on one piece and carry it through all the way to the end because the clients want to see a million different choices. And that's one reason, presumably, why it's before my time, in a, in a sense, but why Photoshop became such a popular tool, because it innate, the time factor, it, it became that if somebody said, I want to see these and I want to see them tomorrow, yeah. it could be done instead yeah. of, oh, my goodness, you know, that's three, four, five paintings by tomorrow can't be done, you know? Yeah. And inside of an agency, they're not just presenting illustration, oh. they're presenting photographic pieces. So when they say they want all these certain posters to be revised, that illustration has to be revised just as quickly as it would take someone to change a tagline right. on a poster. So I think that's also why uh, things just get turned around so fast and a lot of time an illustrator is left in the dark and an in-house designer is doing something to their illustration. <laughs> so it's, it's hard to maintain quality oh. throughout. Right. That's why my favorite client was Roger Corman. Roger did not want to pay for all the roughs and comps and stuff. So I could show him a sketch in my sketchbook and he'd say, go to finish. So I put all my energy into that one picture without having to redraw it 24 times. You know, I've been doing a lot of outside work with uh, a particular uh, agency here in Hollywood and they, they do pitch illustration quite a bit along with, you know, the other possibilities of Photoshop or photographic treatments. And uh, to back up what Akiko said, sometimes it's not just a matter of dozens. It, it can be hundreds of ideas that these, these people are looking through. So you, you, you have that. But there are, there are quite a few that are pitching illustration as a, as a possibility for many of these films. If there's hundreds, that tells me they don't know what they want. Yeah, and the majority of the time, the clients only know what they don't want once they see it. 
So you just have to see so many choices before narrowing it down, unfortunately. Oh, so it's a long process. And, and the, the, the thing that should be is should be perhaps because film productions take a long time. We can uh, attest to that. And so what do you think about the idea of illustrators coming on board to a movie a lot sooner, say like composers become tied to a project a lot earlier these days? Um, what do you, what do you think of that idea? I don't think that that's, uh, I mean, I think it can be possible um, sometimes, but to the point, you know, many uh, of you guys are making right now, like the choice of illustrator, you know, oftentimes comes down to an agency working with the studio. And oftentimes the studio doesn't decide on that agency until pretty far along in the process. So we're kind of among the last people to get picked, you know, to start working on, on, on something. So, you know, in order for them to bring us on earlier, they'd have to sort of get all those ducks in a row beforehand and you know unfortunately they can't always do that occasionally a project might come along though where where the filmmakers are like well i already know who i want to do this poster for me i know what poster i want i want this style this is the style i want i want that i want that style like you know someone might be in love with the kiko's work very high concept very you know it's got uh different you can read things into it in on many levels it's like a different kind of thing than something that like Steve might do or, or Drew would have done, or, you know, everybody has a different uh, skill and uh, ability. And so, I mean, there's not just, obviously we're, we're a small minority, but there are a lot of artists out there who have voices. And uh, if their, if their work is of interest to a, a filmmaker, it, it, I believe it it could be something that comes along in a conversation where I want that for to advertise my poster, to advertise my movie. Here's why that won't work, Paul. It's I've, okay. I've, made, I've worked on 60 feature films as a designer. Often they don't know what the film is going to be until it's finally out of the editing room and shown to the public. <clears throat> so they may start out with an idea of what they think the film is going to be, but sometimes these projects take on a life of their own and it takes them places they never expected they would go. So that's why you can't anticipate what the film is gonna be like until an audience sees it. The audience is always the missing component to a film. But nevertheless, I mean, and it's just anecdotal, you know, back in, in the days of, of Bob Peake, you know, with, with the Missouri breaks, he traveled to, was it Montana or Wyoming where they were shooting? hung out on set, drawing Marlon Brando, drawing Jack Nicholson. He was considered part of the crew. I used to work for Sandy Howard. Every year Sandy would come to me, he would have 12 titles. He'd say, uh, terror train, teenage girls terrorized on a train. And so I'd do 12 pictures and on the basis of those titles and those pictures, no scripts, he would get financing for each of those films. Your artwork to promote the film. To, I mean, to get the backing. Yeah, he'd use the artwork to get the financing. Wow. That still happens today. I've been approached a few times for that kind of thing mm -hmm. in recent years as well. And they don't always make it, but I don't know, hopefully it's not my fault. But um, <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's something that still happens today. Question for Rory. Rory, you've been involved in doing these um, alternate movie posters quite a bit. Have there been instances where the studios have turned to you and said, or another artist that's doing that, so we want to use that to promote the film? Yeah. Yeah, that happens, you know. And then I, and other times I've worked with studios where they reference some of the companies that, that, that I work with that got popular over the past decade, and they're like, yeah, we want to make, we want to do something like, you know, Mondo or Bottleneck, or we want that kind of attention, you know. Um, but the advantage, you know, with those companies is that there's uh, an autonomy there and a freedom to do, you know, uh, uh, whatever you want and take some risks because it's not being used commercially. So it's sort of hard to take that approach to working on, on these official posters because there they have their own set of goals and you're not given that freedom to sort of, you know, experiment and play all over the board. But um, yeah, but there have been a couple, you know, like Studio Canal came after we had done a poster for The Graduate a couple of years ago. And um, 
they were going to uh, be doing a big re-release overseas, like a 50 year anniversary. And so they were gonna bring it back to the theaters and do a big push with, you know, Blu-ray sales and whatnot. And, and they came to us and they said, hey, this would be perfect as opposed to going back to, you know, some of the older images that had been used again and again. And uh, yeah, so then I, you know, sold them that work and then they put it on, you know, all of those materials and posters and quads and whatnot. And, they sent me a box of, you know, extra marketing material they had floating around too. So I had like coasters and keychains and backpacks and totes and all that. <laughs> they put it on. But uh, yeah, so I mean, I, I, you know, but I also think that the alternative poster scene, you know, and I'm fortunate that I've gotten to dip into it both a little bit. Like, I think that's its own beast. And I think that's always going to be around now in its own, in its own way, like, like gig posters, you know, and it's going to, always sort of play by its own rules and, you know, and, and sometimes the studios take interest in it, but when they, you know, but there's, you know, uh, limits to what alternative posters can, can do for official studio use. And that's always going to be the case. So, you know, their approach is always going to be a little bit different. Well, I understand that, but I guess where I was headed with it is the fact that this whole little cottage industry has blown up and become so popular that it kind of, speaks to the idea that the illustrator is wanted in at least oh, yeah. some. And, and, and when you're doing work for, for one of those galleries and releasing those alternative posters, the artist's name is on everything. Like they're pushing it, you know, at the front, you know, of, of their marketing, like artwork by so-and-so, check out this new screen print by so-and-so, you know, which is the complete opposite, obviously, of the studio where like you had mentioned, like we don't even show up under craft services. Like we're not anywhere to be seen on that credits list on a film. But, um, but when you work in the alternative scene, that's the whole allure of it. And these collectors are collecting individual artists' pieces. So that they want to know who's making the art and they want particular artists to contribute to different you know, genres of films that they want to collect for. So, so it's its own you know, sort of beast. But I don't think it's like that's not expandable to the wider public, maybe a diluted version of it. But in the same way as in the past, illustrators have been you know, for want of a better term, household names. I think what you're describing is a way that art, handmade art, whether it's digital or paint and pencil, handmade art, the touch of the artist makes a direct communication contact with other human beings. You know, in a way that if you like the coldness of just Photoshop images being cobbled together, just never can that I've seen, you know? Mm. It's not that Photoshop is the enemy, it's to do with the person who's manipulating. Do you know what I mean? Everybody's talked about what they're doing and, and their lifestyle. And it, it's funny because I seem to be one of the older guys in the mix here. And <laughs> I retired when I saw what was happening in the industry. And I haven't done a, a, a poster uh, in 15, 20 years now. The reason I'm, I'm learning from you and I haven't said anything is because you're all talking about how we can do this. And you're going backwards in time. Because when I first started, I'd sit down with the studio and they'd all talk with they, about what they wanted. And then they'd talk to me and I, uh, and I would listen to what they were saying. And then I'd go away and come back in a week with some sketches and they'd pick one and I'd paint them. They didn't have a, a computer to work off of. So that wasn't a choice. And that's true for advertising too, besides movie posters, just regular, uh, you know, commercial advertising that way. Yeah, it's artwork. See, there, a lot of you have been talking like, oh, when Guillermo went to Paris and they were talking for the release of, of Pan's Labyrinth, and somebody said, uh, how come Drew's art 
is just art. It doesn't look like a poster. It looks like art. Huh. It's, what's wrong with art? <clears throat> uh, it's it's only been art for you know what thousand years. <laughs> <laughs> Because it's, it's designed to communicate to humans. Is this about love or goodness or kindness or beauty or truth? What's it about? That's what I painted. That's how I did my work. And that's why it, it addressed people. And it seems to be lost when it becomes all this bigger thing like, well, we can do this overnight. And it can be done simply and, and cheaply. I don't know about cheaply. Nobody talked about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you're right. You're right. You got that right. I mean, I go to conventions like this thing is going to be shown at. And people come up to me and, and say, thank you. Thank you. I, I'm training my child to be an artist because of you. I went to see this movie because of what you did. That's, for me, that's what fed me and it made me happy and made me feel like I was doing something good for humanity, not just for a movie, although that's what paid me. But I did it to make my family money and make myself happy and make myself self feel like I know what I'm doing. I'm an artist right. and I'm not ashamed of it. This is why I do it. But I, I like uh, what Robert Rodriguez, what you said was it's in the other industries too, illustration for, I'm working on a book cover now and their big thing was, how does it look on the shelf with the other books that are like it? That's the whole thing. You got to, what fraction of a second to grab that attention? Yeah, so I, I had to I had to homogenize my work to go along with this lineup that they gave me. I wanted well, to be better than that, but they wanted it to, to be like that. Wouldn't that make your book invisible on the shelf? Right. That's my thinking. Wow. I'm going to put an extra twinkle. It's a woman's story about a woman. I'm going to put an extra twinkle in her eye. That'll kid him. How many twinkles you got? <laughs> <laughs> hey, Drew, um, are you are you going to have stuff in the Lucas Museum they're building or built? I don't know. George hasn't said. Uh, I I know it's it's close to finish, and, and I haven't talked to George since he got married and moved to where's his wife come from? Chicago. So I haven't talked to him in, in quite a long time. You, Maybe. Have you got I'm a? Um, you let me know. <laughs> you got a little something happening in Texas, is that right, Drew? Yeah, there's the guy uh, that used to own six Comic Cons, and uh, he owned. Uh, he didn't own, but he had in his group all the Star Wars characters, Harrison Ford and and. Mark Hamill and Carrie Fisher were all in it. And then things felt started to fall apart. And Harrison didn't want to do it anymore. And Carrie died. In the meantime, he was following me. And when it started to fall apart, he called me and got me into the Comic Cons. Well, he also happened to love my work. And so he started to buy it, and now he's, he built a, a, a gallery in Texas, and he is now handling all my works, and they're all for sale. And uh, we just sent 500 pieces of my work down to Texas, all for sale. I'll see you guys later. I got to go to Dallas. I know, I got to go to <laughs> If we all chip in, we might be able to buy one piece. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, oh, I've had fantastic. a strange life. I did, I did what I do because I, I was talking to a guy in, in Paris uh, yesterday, and uh, he asked me, you know, 
how did I get to uh, start to be an artist? And I told him how I did it. It was because I can't talk well. When I, when I was a kid and I was thirsty, I would draw a glass of water and, and water falling into the glass and I would give that picture to my mother and then she'd know what I wanted. I know the reason I paint is to sell the movie, but it's also to make people happy. The poster itself, to make it beautiful, to make it loving, to make it true, to make it kind. Well, I think it still felt that everything you were doing was, um, was still a form of self-expression. It was your oh, yeah. self-expression in response to mm. this, all right, it's a product, whatever you want to call it. But nevertheless, yeah. it was still absolutely your self-expression, which would have been as different in what you saw in that thing as, we'll say, John Elvin, John Elvin, Richard Amsel. Any of those people would have yep. seen the same thing and not come up with the same images as you. Oh, no. And not any less valid, but just different artists having a personal response to what they've seen or read. Yeah. But see, you're using the word artist again. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's all I was saying. This is what I do. This is why I did it. That was uh, always the thing for me in illustrating books, you know, was to take it and make it mine. I, Alice in Wonderland, my God, I panicked when, when, when I first took the job. Dean had a home publishing company, my wife. And she said, you're doing Alice in Wonderland. I said, holy God, there's like 500 people have done that. Who sell more about it? You have to get inside of it and make it your own. Yeah. Right, Drew? You mm -hmm. make it your own thing. Now it's yeah. yours. There's a documentary coming out for, uh, uh, about Greg and his work and his career. Um, I, no, go on. Was, <laughs> I just think it's, it's, it's only coming. Cool. Yeah, well, no, it's coming. From, I don't know if everyone's aware, you see, but it's coming from the same um, director, Eric Sharkey, and he's teamed up with uh, Kevin Burke, who did the 24 by 36 documentary. And uh, I've seen a, a, a clip of it. I've actually been interviewed. I'm actually in it. And then I think Drew's in it. I don't know who else might be in it, but uh, it is looking really good. I mean, he's a good looking guy here, but you see him on there working. <laughs> oh my God. I think well, everyone's going to love it. I just wanted to get that out there. Yes. <laughs> you know the name of it? What's the name of the documentary? Is it just your name? Or? I don't think he has a name. We ain't got a we have, there's probably a, oh, like I say, my my career is just freaky. It's like from animation in Detroit to these films. I told you, uh, social conscious raising films for about six years. I did half a dozen of them. The whole damn thing. I mean, everything except make the law stop. <laughs> just about, you know. And <laughs> and then children's general children's book and tons of books are golden books and you know. The, books on hippopotamus and pandas and dinosaurs and you name it you know They're little scratch and sniff books and little kitty cats and stuff tons of that stuff paperback hey. stuff. it's all over the place it's just like crazy you know and i don't and and i and i don't you know i like i don't know what i want to do next but i'm still figuring there's something around the next bend i have no idea what the hell it is and i, I don't want to know but there's you know something there you know yeah so, that's that, one of I, the I, wonderful I, things yeah, that's one of the wonderful for things about not just your career, but everybody here. Really, we don't just. It's not like we have to stick with one. You know, you've done movie posters, you've done uh, fine art, you you know, you've done you name it, publishing, comic books, and it's it's a similar story for a lot of us here. You know, we, we we've maybe started in one thing, and then people have asked us to do other things, and uh, it's that's. And we have to be accepting of that and not be, no, 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 I only do that thing. And I think we have to, you know, we, that's what we have to do. We do whatever anyone asks us to do. We look at it. If it's something that we think we can do, or if it's going it, to, there are projects that come along to me and I'm, and I'm, I'm say, maybe let me see because yeah. some of the projects do yeah. not fit what sure. I want to do at all. But, um, you have to kind and of be. I think it's a matter that you take on each thing too, the same amount of abuse. <clears throat> kind of yeah. like I do anyway. I mean, I, I just, I'm interested in a lot of stuff, you know, and, and so it just, you just tap it, you just get into it, you, you let it take you over, kind of a thing, you know. 
I love your work because you're influenced by the same guy I was when I was a kid. I forget the name, his name. It's Maxwell Parrish, Howard Pyle, N.C. Wyeth. Howard Pyle and N.C. Wyeth. My parents bought me the, the books. Yeah. I never read one of them. All I did was learn from the <laughs> I, I grew up on that stuff. My parents had all the uh, Wyeth books. My God, I can, Treasure Island. Yeah, you know, oh, okay. it's for the every one of them. Yeah, the Burrow stuff or the Jay Allen St. John stuff. Uh -huh. I mean, uh, my God, it was like whoa! It was like entering this whole separate reality. Yeah, and that's why I love your work because you reflect what you learn from him. It's you know? About gathering the information and inspiration. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. We're taking this way off with no note, I know. Oh, no, 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 no. It's right up. And, and, and oh, well, this is, right? this this is, is brilliant. brilliant. It's all and, we, we all stand on the shoulders of giants. Yeah. Oh, my God. Now, that was one of the questions that, Paul, you had put in a little line up here, is where the influences, the mentors, the influence uh, that kind of motivated all of us. So That's we right. all have it. I always thought yeah. Greg, your stuff um, way back from the Hobbit calendars and Lord of the Rings. N.C. Wyeth was real obvious that somebody that you were influenced by, but the thing was, it never looked like you were ripping him off. It just <laughs> it was like this <laughs> osmosis thing. Gustav Tengren, too. I mean, my God, my brother and I were freaking nuts about him. You know, yeah. the Pinocchio yeah. Snow White stuff. And, you know, it's like, it's almost hard to let it out of your head to get rid of it, to try to, you know? Yep. And that's, and, but I mean, you talk about the female illustrators too, Eleanor Rabbit, Jesse Wilcox Smith. Oh. oh my God, Dorothy Lathrop. Oh, oh, beautiful stuff, man. The design has, you're always struggling with, three, should it be 3D and rendered or should I take it on as a flat design Japanese look? And I still, I'm still in my head about that stuff. Always fighting, there's a battle going on, you know? Well, what? Where I've descended to is we're all talking about art now. Descended into the. If that's what I think we are gathering of, art is thousands of years old. It's, it's made humanity what humanity needs to be and should be. Oh, we wouldn't be here if it was not for art. I, I think we would have wiped ourselves out eons ago. Yeah, it's the universal language. Yeah, you may, not, you may not speak the, the languages of the people you're talking to, but you can show them a picture and everyone understands the picture. Exactly. Mm -hmm. A glass of water with water going in it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what was your first commercial job? Here? The very first thing you did. Well, now you have a story. <laughs> I remember that. Do you? I knew, I knew Drew when he was getting out of college. We met through our lives. One of the first jobs I remember Drew having, you correct me if I'm wrong, there used to be a tire company called Winston Tires. Wasn't that it? And you did some black and white drawings that were in the newspaper and we were going, wow, a paying job doing illustration. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty cool. Well, I can talk how I got into the movie industry in the first place, you know, it's because I was working for album covers I remember that. Yeah, I did that. Uh, With Ernie, Ernie Cephalou doing Alice Cooper. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, Alice Cooper had a 60-foot a billboard on Sunset Boulevard. And uh, an art director working for Tony Seininger drove by it and, and took a, a quick left turn and went back to work and said, we got to get this guy to start painting movie posters. The next day I was painting movie posters and I never stopped until. <laughs> you know. I, heard an in, I heard an interesting story of a Kiko, how she got in the business. Maybe she could tell that story. Didn't uh, you get a job and as a kind of a, a, a secretary or something? And then it blossomed. No, I, mean, I was just moving back to Los Angeles from New York and I just needed any, any job at all. And um, a friend of mine, she was working at a movie poster advertising agency. And she said they were looking for a receptionist. So I went and interviewed with one of the owners and I just happened to have an, um, an illustration in Spin Magazine. I was doing editorial illustration at that time. 
And um, I showed it to him. And because he was a painter, he said, well, you shouldn't be answering phones. Maybe you can try this movie poster stuff. <laughs> and um, I was like, I don't even know how to use a computer. Are you crazy? <laughs> but um, I, they basically took, had me come in um, kind of on probation for a few months and learn the ropes. And that was the beginning of a whole new chapter for me. So it was interesting how that all happened. <laughs> so we all have different stories that why we got into this in the first place. Yeah. I mean, I lived, I couldn't even feed my family. I had a son and a wife and we lived off of the earth, I guess. <laughs> I, I did live within walking distance from Hollywood. And, and I said, hmm, album covers. Maybe I would like to do up <clears throat> so I could walk up the street a couple of miles. And I brought my portfolio. And so a week later, I got two offers for work, one at Disney and one at Pacific Eye and Air. I went to Disney and they said, they stuck me in a, in a four by four room about as big as this again, and asked me to draw uh, Spock. Spock. And then I went to a second one and it was Pacific Eye and Ear and they did album covers as well. So uh, Disney asked me to do backgrounds. Yeah, background paintings for their cartoons. And uh, I went to Pacific Eye and Ear and they were doing album covers. So I said, hmm, if I was, if I just painted backgrounds, nobody would ever know who I am. That's right. And then I went to Pacific Eye and Ear and I did an album cover a day and I signed my work. <clears throat> That's what started it. And you got a credit on the back of the album more than likely too. Yeah, I did. So that's, so I didn't know what I was doing, but it worked out anyway. So. <laughs> I started out a little smaller. I started uh, at 18 opaquing cells for Air Force training film. Uh, a commercial job. Yeah. And an industrial film producer in Detroit, where I'm from. For nine months, just opaquing these little pie cuts, you know, the friendly... Of course, with two tones of blue, you know, a light blue on the bottom and a dark blue on the top, and these little pie cuts flew around, and, and a ribbon followed them, showing the formations. Oh yeah. And of course, the enemy was red back in the day. Of this course, the bad guys. <laughs> this, this was 1958, you know. Uh huh. That was my first job. That's lovely. That's lovely. Well, I did worse than that. I did, I did drawings of toilets. I did. Well, drawings. <laughs> hey, look at I still got toilet drawings here. This <laughs> is my toilet training book. So <laughs> we all are all so I, mean, I got a, I I a story. Any about. job that you can get that comes your way as a as an artist in this world. Oh, yeah. I mean, boom, yeah. you give it everything you got. Yeah, you 20, bucks, 20 bucks a piece. Yep. <laughs> what you get. <laughs> and you also by doing that, you learn what you don't, don't want to do. Exactly. Yeah. 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 True. That's true. Someone like Leonardo da Vinci, if you fast forward and brought them to the future to today, yeah. and you saw them what, if you showed them what a computer was capable of in an art program, the technology and how it works, they would just be flying with it, I believe. Because yeah. the artists of the of the past, their technology was the paints, the brushes. They were the, at the, the top of their technology chain. They invented things, they made new things to make art. And I think if they saw what a computer could do, I don't think they'd be afraid. I think they would and uh, go for it and, and, and still create with a computer. I draw from Michelangelo and Leonardo. And I did it all. That was my education. And I chose to I do what did I do. It's a handmade thing in, in my hand, you know? Mm -hmm. Know that it's handmade. Tangible. Feels, yeah. It was good to work with the with all the paints and brushes and yeah, I cut. I love paper. I love paper. I've always loved paper ever since I saw Treasure Island and Billy Bones with the treasure map. You know, it's like it's like <laughs> I love paper. It's just, it's something beautiful about paper, and and I love scissors. I love to cut and I tape, and it's so physical. 
you know, when I made movies, I worked on a movieola and did hot splice editing and, and you know, ran camera. And I love that. I just love that whole physical thing, you know? It's just, and you end up with this, in paint you, or drawing, you end up with a thing in your hand that you know you made. Yeah, that's and true. That feeling. And I'm not denying. I see you nodding, yes. Well, about Leonardo in the computer. I'm sure he'd go nuts about it, you know? Yeah. But it's, you know what I mean? It's like that, and I'm not anti-technological. I mean, but I, that feeling of a handmade thing, I know I made this thing, you know? I, I love, love uh, I love using the computer to bill my clients. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a I don't know how to use one except on this to get my reference. It's the only thing. <laughs> right. You and my wife, I do the paintings, she does the billing. Yeah, it exactly. all comes together. Good deal. Jean, Jean's creative as hell, but, but you know, she knows all this other stuff. Oh, yeah. Very simple. Well, very I, read where, I read where Norman Rockwell made a comment in one of the books that he had out. He said, every generation will make its own art. And isn't that true? When you go back in time, you, you look at people like Rembrandt, they laughed at him at first. They laughed at Van Gogh. They laughed at the impressions. Every generation kind of flipped over the table and it was something new. Yeah. So we did our thing with the movie posters, but there's still something there that really is still alive. And another generation has taken it in another place. My first paying job as an artist was as an animator I know. In, in Hollywood on Sunset. And, and uh, one day Drew came by on the invitation for lunch. We went to lunch together. He came in and he, wanted, he looked at what we were doing. And he said something that struck me at that time. He said, you know, you drew, you draw hundreds of drawings to make one picture. And I draw one drawing to make hundreds of pictures. And I thought, hmm. And at that point. I didn't know I was that bright. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You don't, you forgot about it. Yeah. <laughs> and that was about the time that John Alvin had painted his first poster, which was Blazing Saddles. Mm -hmm. And I looked at that and coupled with the things that Drew was doing, I said, you know what, I should be doing that. So then I started setting my sights on going in that direction. It took me a lot longer to get with it, but that was the influence I had from that time back in the 70s. I'm amazed yeah. in this day and age with all the magnificent art there is, you know, in, in film and in comics that I'm still getting art to do at 80 years yeah. old. You know, mm. like I said, that's a beauty of our profession. Age doesn't mean it. In a way, that's true. Yeah, that's very yeah. true. If you're, yeah. You keep young and you know, and you just stay with it. You, you, you stay tuned to what's going on. You look at what's happening. Yeah. And, and you can just keep it up to forever, you know? I've enjoyed working with some of the younger people that are just coming out of college in this studio that I go in occasionally for. And uh, it it's kind of, re re you know, revitalizes me. Yeah. I, I enjoy that. Yeah. And I know these two guys here, um, I'm, I'm going like this, but on the screen, I'm looking at uh, uh, Bob Rodriguez and then also James Goodrich. They've gone yeah. in a direction of doing Western art, which is pretty fabulous. And I've seen both of their, uh, both of what they've done is just terrific work. I remember yeah. a story that um, Greg Spelanka told me. Um, they, he was in uh, Art Center with um, Matt Mahira. And uh, he was working on an assignment for the next day, and it wasn't coming out. And Mahirin was over there, and uh, and he says, "You're overworking it." And he says, "Well, you know, it's due tomorrow." And he says, "Here's what you do." And he took the painting and he chucked it out the window <laughs> off the balcony, and and. Greg's going, "Oh my God, that's my assignment!" And he ran out. A car drove over it. And it got <laughs> scraped up on the street. And when he brought it back in, he, he says it was much better. And he really <laughs> <laughs> I can see that coming. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Oh, good times. It's beautiful that we can get together because we inspire each other and we realize we're all in the same boat. We keep in boat. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Uh-huh. So <laughs> we're we're helping one another and I think that's a beautiful thing that we have had this opportunity to do. And I thank you for it.